Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to PhotoBiz Live. This is Joanne from the PhotoBiz team, and today we're joined by Landon Day of Daydream Photography for a webinar about lighting. Seeing and predicting lights one of the hardest things to understand, but once you do, a whole other world is opened up to you. Come and learn from Landon how to avoid making it harder than it needs to be. In addition to getting the opportunity to learn from Landon in today's webinar, we'll also have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. You can submit your questions using the chat tool and they'll be answered after the presentation. You can also join in the discussion on Twitter by using the hashtag PhotoBizLive. If at any point during today's webinar you have any difficulty hearing the speaker or seeing the slides, please use the comment box and let me know. We'll also be recording this webinar and it'll be available on our YouTube channel for replay at youtube.com slash photobiz. With that being said, I'll turn things over to Landon. Good afternoon guys, how are we doing? Joanne, I, will you just tell me if you can see my screen so I know kind of how it's working? Mm -hmm. Yep, we can see the screen. Okay, perfect. Well, like she said, guys, my name is Lane today, and uh, some of you may have heard of me. A lot of you probably haven't. Um, I'm not a uh, Richard Sturdivant of sorts, but um, go around and then do some some webinars. And I do some conferences. Um, I'll be speaking at a couple coming up in January and February. So if you're around, I'd love to meet you guys. Be sure to stop by and say hi. Um, yeah, let's just dive right into it. some bullets of. Uh, about what we're going to cover. We're going to cover uh, lighting for the most part. That's what today's webinar is on. I don't know if any of you guys were on a webinar that I did with PhotoBiz and maybe a year, 18 months ago or so, and, and it was called buzz editing. And at that point, I said the buzz or that editing and editing in a cool, unique way was something that was going to really separate the professionals from the people that were trying to be professionals because um, my, my reasoning was is I understood Photoshop and I understood Photoshop better than most people. I wasn't just playing actions, I could do some things that people couldn't do. Well today is going to be kind of a, an apology of sorts if that makes sense. Um, over the last uh, two years I finished up my uh, CPP process and we'll get into a little bit of that coming up but it really opened my eyes to a bunch of different things and, and one of the biggest was lighting. Um, even after the fact, once I finished my CPP, uh, talked to, uh, just said Richard, talked to Richard Sturdivant and kind of gave him an apology of sorts because for the longest time I thought of him as a, an editor, as someone who was amazing at Photoshop and, and don't hear me wrong, he certainly is, but he understands lighting with the best of them and I didn't see that until I understood lighting. So what we're going to go through today is over some, some real simple solutions to strobes for in studio and then understanding speed lights and how they work. We're going to spend a little more time on speed lights than we are on anything else. Uh, talking about the TTL and the manual settings. I don't know if any of you saw my links that I posted up on Facebook but because I can't spell we're going to end this with talking about lightning photos. Um, I meant to put lighting and it ended up as lightning so we're going to end today on doing some uh, tips on lightning photography ju just because we can. Um, and I don't think time's going to allow, but if it does, we'll get into some post-processing uh, and getting consistent, repeatable results. I think that's the key, is the repeatable results that you can count on every time. Okay, so who am I? Uh, I have a major and minor in art. I am a certified professional photographer and a CPP liaison. If you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas, um, I am your liaison and would love to talk to you about that if you're interested in going through the process. I know CPP is not for everyone, uh, but I do think it opened my eyes unlike many things I've ever done. Um, I own Daydream Photography down in Mansfield and we're just on the south side of Arlington, about uh, 20 minutes from uh, the ballpark in Arlington where the Rangers play and there's that other team that plays football there too, but I'm more of a baseball guy. Uh, I used to teach high school art and photo. Uh, at Mansfield High and about six years ago jumped out to doing uh, photography full time. Uh, here it says five, I think it's a little bit dated, I think December is actually six years. Uh, and in 2014 it marked ten years that I've been doing professional photography. And by professional I mean getting paid to do it, not just doing it for like trying to build my portfolio. Uh, I don't know if many people will tell you this information, but I'm pretty much an open book. If you want to take a second and jot down some of this stuff, there's my cell phone, 
and there's my email address, my Facebook page, my web address, um, and my Instagram handle. I am not on Twitter other than it following what I post on Facebook and Instagram, so I wouldn't try to follow me there. But this is, what, five ways, six ways to get a hold of me. And I'm an open book and love to talk. I'm just a nerd um, that likes to talk about photo stuff. So um, jot some of that information down if you ever want to get a hold of me. Uh, Christian husband, father of a four-year-old girl and two-year-old boy. That was our photo that we took uh, Thanksgiving last year, so it's right at a year old now of uh, my wife and kids. Uh, give a quick shout-out to PhotoBiz. I, I've been with PhotoBiz now since 2004. Um, I'm not around a whole lot of companies that I am as ecstatic about as PhotoBiz, and for me to hang around them for almost a decade now, uh, and watch them grow. We were talking a little bit ago with Joanne before everybody came on. I joined PhotoBiz before they even offered a Flash website. Not HTML5, not, nothing like that, before they even offered Flash. And it's been great to see them grow and see how they've helped me and my company. If you are going to be in the um, Orlando area in January, this is just a quick plug for somewhere that I'm going to be teaching uh, at SPI. And it's all going to be on speed lighting. I'm teaching two different classes there. Going to be real hands-on and speed lighting in January. It's at, at SPI in Orlando in downtown Disney area. That is the only plug I'm going to give you guys. Here is what my studio looks like here in our booming town of downtown Mansfield. Give you guys just a second to watch this. The more I watch this video, it moves a little bit slow. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move off of this. It just isn't going to give you anything in there that I haven't already given you. Um, so we're going to move into some different lighting setups. Um, I use I use constant light, I use strobe, and I use speed lights all the time. Almost every shot I do is going to have some sort of lighting applied to it. There will be times when I am a, a quote-unquote natural light photographer, um, but most of the time I'm doing something to supplement and control the light. Uh, even if that means just where I'm placing people, I'm trying to look and see and control light that I can. Um, that gets done a little bit less when I'm working with younger kids, because younger kids don't sit still very long. But I don't do nearly as many kids as I do uh, high school seniors. So what we're seeing here, go back to this one. But this is this is a typical setup for my constant light. This is a ring light in the back called my ring light, and it is a constant light. And I use it more as a kicker slash hair light than I do as an actual ring light. I'm going to show you an example of it as a ring light, but for the most part, it's just a hair separation kicker light. This light over here on the side that we're fixing to see is what we call the beast. This is a, an eight foot by eight foot wall light that we call it and it has 25 100 watt bulbs. Now I always wanted to have a window light uh, or a natural window in my studios that I had before the one that we just saw. This is my third studio um, and hope to never have to move again. But I never had a big natural light window so we made one and it's always sunny next to this window and it's this beautiful soft light but it's, it's 8 foot by 8 foot, it rolls around, it tilts and it has 25 100 watt bulbs in it. And they're all uh, daylight balance bulbs that I just bought at Lowe's. So here's some examples now going forward. I'm going to try to walk you through the setups of what we did and how we did it. Um, this is the only one I'm going to show you that was actually using a ring light. 
ring light is a real flat light, and that's why I don't use it a whole lot. But sometimes it just it just works and makes our eyes just go crazy. This one uh, is using only that big wall light that you just saw. It's off on the camera right, and that's all it's there is just that one big light. The advantage of using the constant light as well with um, with everything but mainly kids, is you don't have to worry about the flashes making them blink or scaring them or whatever. Once they get adjusted to the lights, you're good to go and set uh, and just do all your shooting or without having to startle them with flashes. Same setup here. You can see that they've got this little kicker light coming over here on the side of her face and her shoulder. That's just that ring light back here in the background uh, on camera left. If you were to zoom in or if you get close to your monitors, you might see a bunch of dots in his eyes. That is that big wall light. It does leave kind of a unique lighting pattern, but it ends up being just a big square like it would be a 4 by 6 softbox or something, but it's all those dots from the bulbs. One more here. Now, and you can see the dots in her eyes again. Now, one of the big advantages of shooting with the constant lights is that you can... Uh, shoot at really low f-stops. If you're like me, I have a hard time shooting with my strobes at anything less than man, maybe maybe five six. But with my constant lights, I can go all the way down to one four and just adjust my shutter speed accordingly to get those backgrounds to soften like this one is. This is one of the, uh, Danny's background, and it's a kind of a busy wall texture look. But when you shoot at two eight or lower, then it just melts into this pretty uh, soft background and blends in with. Uh, Everything really makes her pop and stand off of it. Okay, so here is my typical strobe setup. This is position-wise going to be basically just like I do with my constants. I have a kicker hair light in the back that is high enough that it works as my separation slash background slash um, kicker light, and then I have a typically use a big modifier up front. This one that you see here is a, is a modified parabolic umbrella. And it's real big. I, I prefer real big modifiers because I like that super soft light. Um, this one, the one you see here, will actually shoot through or bounce off of, but I prefer to bounce um, back into the, the person instead of shooting through. I just think it's a little bit softer, and that's how I, I prefer it. Now here's going to be some examples using that exact same setup with the one light up front and one light in the back. And, these lights are basically facing each other. If you put her in the middle and draw an X, the the light, my light placement is always going to be in one of those corners of the X, facing directly at each other. Um, when I started, I struggled and I tried to use three, four, maybe five lights. I, I read, oh, I need a hair light from up top. I need a fill light on the, you know, the weak side. I need my main light. I need a separation light. I need a kicker light. And I tried to do all this stuff, and it was just so complicated and I never really understood it. I never knew why I didn't understand it. I'm like, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing. Um, I read this blog or I did this and I says I need to have four lights. Well, I've really learned that once I've dumped it down to two, most of the time, and I'm not going to say every time, but most of the time, once I've dumped it down to two lights, I'm a much, much happier person with my lighting. So instead of being, this one's going to be real directional. A uh, short light, this is going to be a lot more of a beauty light. But the same setup, is the light's just a little bit more up on top than on the side. Professional headshots, exactly the same way. Have them face the light, turn your head to you, and done. Okay, so typical settings when I'm shooting with my strobes. Um, I found that if I shoot at around 6.3 or faster, that softens the backgrounds just enough to release those um, wrinkles and imperfections and creases from being folded or being packed and moved, uh, especially on my solids. I shoot solid gray a lot, and if I just shoot at 6.3 or softer uh, or faster, then that's going to really soften those. So I don't have to spend as much time in Photoshop later getting rid of the creases and wrinkles, etc. And I normally shoot with a really long lens, even inside. Um, 70 is kind of 70 to 110 is my sweet spot area, uh, anywhere from my 85.14 to uh, to my 70-200, of course. That's kind of my go-to two lenses, but I'm a lens nerd, if any of you know me. I have a slew of lenses. 
Okay, so let, let's move off of studio and uh, constant lights. Um, do we have any questions about either of those before I move on to speed lights? Now may be a good second to take a, a breather and answer any of those. Sure, COD ha uh, had a question about whether the beast is incandescent or fluorescent bulbs. They are all fluorescent. Um, when I started, I had some halogen hot lights, and they're called hot lights for a reason. And they, I had a kid I should reach in and burn uh, her hand really bad and blister up on us, and that's that's never good for a whole bunch of reasons. But these bulbs get warm, but you can actually walk around and touch them, and they're not going to hurt you. And that's why we chose to go uh, with those fluorescents. But they're just daylight fluorescents. On the boxes themselves at Lowe's, you can read your Kelvin temperatures. So I knew my ring light was 5400. I found some bulbs that were 5500, and they're close enough to uh, to match the white balance really well. Okay, great. And Speedy asks if they are spiral bulbs. They are. Yep. Great. I think that's the only questions that we had so far. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so moving on to speed lights. Do you understand TTL? You you know that it probably means through the lens, just like your SLR means a single lens reflex, but do you really understand what TTL is? It just blows my mind to think about how much information is sent and received in such a crazy fast time. Uh, I will shoot with my speed lights at a four thousandths of a second uh, on high speed sync in TTL, and to think of how fast that is, but then how fast they still have to sit there and modify. Sorry, did we get disconnected there temporarily? Can you hear me okay? Um, I can hear you now. There was like a little click and then it came back. Okay, great, great. Sorry about that. Okay, so TTL-wise, I use just a little pop-up 18-inch um, softbox most of the time. And the, I'm going to be walking through these examples again and kind of diagram for you. But most of my shots, the softbox is going to be really close to uh, the subject, like barely out of camera. So this one is probably just barely right here off the camera, and this is just an 18-inch uh, pop-up flash uh, or pop-up um, softbox that folds up on itself into a little bitty pouch. But I prefer the 18-inch over my bigger ones because I feel like it doesn't give me as hot of hot spots. My bigger ones, I could probably work around it if I had a baffle of sorts on the inside, but the smaller ones, I don't seem to get such uh, such a hot spot out of them. Um, again, this is just going to be kind of my go-to setting. It's going to be one light, and it's going to be off camera, one side or the other, and just above their nose to where we're sure the shadow is creeping down instead of creeping up. This is kind of a good example to show that on, too, because you need to have the light hitting under her hat. Uh, we don't want the shadow from the light or from her hat coming under her eyes, but it's important that that shadow still creeps down a little bit instead of creep up. It's just a lot more natural of a light. All of these shots that we're showing you were taken in basically the middle of the afternoon, and you can control how moody your photo is just by understanding how your TTL lights work, and we're going to touch on that here in just a moment. Um, but this is, again, just one light off to the camera right and underexposed by probably about two and a half stops in camera to give it a little bit moodier, or, yes, more moody light, a light that's a little more moody. That sounds better, a light that's a little more moody. Same way with this one, middle of the afternoon, but when you get your settings dialed in, you're able to go through and really uh, give it some mood and some depth that you wouldn't have before. This is a window behind my studio that's photographer heaven, and at any any given day, there's a photographer shooting up next against this window with somebody, kids, senior, family, etc. But when you do the lighting right, it really pops it off and separates now what I'm able to do versus what other photographers are able to do instead of just using it as a natural light because it is in the shade almost all the time you get to have that directional light and create the mood that it probably didn't have before. This one's actually sitting in the water here. Uh, Mom is standing in the water holding the uh, speed light and probably just just barely off the side of the camera again. But this lets me have the reflections, it lets me keep the colors in the back. Because it was so bright in the day, um, it's able to let me bring all that color back in. This is the photo that we just saw with me and my family. Again, this is just one speed light off camera left. I get asked all the time, um, people around our hometown know this road, and they ask if, it, if I had printed it and made it into a background because it didn't look like we were taken on that road because it looked so 
everything just pops so well. But when you underexpose just a tad in the background to fill in with your light, it lets you keep the highlights and the shadows back in the background that would have been blown out otherwise. So it's all about balancing your available light with the light that you're filling in with for, from your speed lights. As you can tell, probably this is by far the most used lighting technique that I have. It's just the one light and shooting TTL. Now, I'm probably a sight to see when I'm working by myself. I don't typically work by myself with senior girls. Um, just from what I learned when I used to be a teacher, you kind of have to watch yourself. But with senior guys, especially, I'll shoot just me and just me and my senior. And I'll shoot with a monopod basically jabbed into my hip and hand hold the light off in the distance to where I can place it exactly where I need to be. But it's, it's a sight for C when I'm holding my 7200 lens with one hand and my light on a monopod with the other hand and what that balancing act really looks like. Um, again, this is just the one light, but this one is up more of a beauty lit uh, shot instead of uh, off to the side. You see the shadow dropping under her nose and the catch lights in the top of her eyes instead of the left and right with the shadow going left or right from her nose. That's the difference in a beauty lit shot versus a directional lit shot. Not that it's not directional, uh, it's just light placement. Okay, so before I move on to that, um, how, how I get these settings and how I get these exposures is depending on what my background looks like, I may or may not pay much attention to it. But if my background is really bright, then using my light meter and camera, shooting on manual, I will set my f-stop to whatever that is. And most of the time when I'm shooting a single person, um, I'm shooting at 2.8 or all the way down to 1.4. I shoot pretty fast and I don't really care what my backgrounds are most of the time. So that being said, I will set my, my light meters uh, set on spot meter. I'll point it up in the sky or in the trees in the background and set my meter in my camera to where it exposes correctly for the background. Then at that point, I recompose the shot. I focus on them without changing any of my settings. And when I come back to my subject, they're typically very underexposed. Um, stop, stop and a half, maybe even two or more. Um, and all I'm doing is I'm letting now my speed light set on TTL correct for all the exposure. So now my exposure is matching her face and the background. Let's go back to maybe some of these that are a little more dramatic. So I meter on this one for the trees back here on the top, which were the brightest part. Again, this is in the afternoon. And I'm able to meter for the leaves back here in the background and then fill in all of this to match the background. Instead of just filling in here and letting the background wash out like you would see most of the time, or exposing for the background, and this would all be really dark, maybe even almost silhouetted, that one light, by not changing anything and letting the TTL do all the math for me, is able to match those exposures. I hope that makes sense. I hope I didn't uh, tell you something you didn't already know, or maybe a new light bulb went off. But when I'm doing this, I'm going to say that one more time, is I'm using my light meter and camera set to spot meter. I'm pointing it up here in the bright part of the photo, and I'm exposing for this shot. Then without changing any of my settings, I bring it down here, focus on normally the, the girl's eyes, focus on her eyes, and then let the camera and the flash do all the TTL math and do all my exposure for me without me having to go through and change anything. It's really beautiful how automatic that is. And once I really learned that, this is where my biggest light bulb moment in photography ever happened was, was understanding how it can figure out all my exposures for me. Okay, so all that up until this point had all been one light TTL. Now this one is just an example of two light TTL. This is in a dark um, mansion converted into a wedding venue, but it's very dark and all I did was shoot the exact same settings. I exposed uh, for a bright part of the lights and let the math of, or let the TTL flashes do all the math to get the exposure correct. Okay, so here's an example of two light on manual settings. There are times when your speed lights just can't do TTL. It's in an extreme situation or you have a vision, you need the light to be exactly how you see in your head. This was one of those cases. This is two light on manual. 
this one is one light on manual and I always show this one it's not because it's an amazing photo but yes you can overpower the sun with one speed light if you understand how to get the most out of your speed light you can go through these situations and this is in you know it's not quite high noon but this is very late morning and you can tell that the light is just streaming in from that sun and this is all overpowered by using just one speed light I'm not having to take my uh, Paul Buff power pack uh, outside and some studio strobes. This is all done with probably just an SB700 Nikon flash. Doing just the opposite, putting it in the back gives a neat rim light shape. And these are all done manual. I'm fixing to tell you what the settings are to do all this. The rim light all back here on him on this one is actually coming from the sun. So I have a light on him from the front and I have a light on the car. So I don't have a light pointing back at him. All of this light here is from, from the sunlight. But you can tell how we match the sunlight with my strobes uh, instead of vice versa. This is on that same road, by the way, the, of me and my family earlier. Three light manual. These are the stadium lights. But you've got one light here. If you look at the shadows, you've got one light behind her. And you've got one light hitting her from this side. But this is three light manual to bring, bring down all that light from the sky in the middle of the afternoon again. Okay, so here is settings for these type settings, for these situations. So we call it the 16-16 rule. If I shoot at f16 at 1 one sixtieth of a second, hence the 16-16, and I set my flash to half power at 50 millimeter on the zoom, I am almost always a sure end for the correct exposure if my speed lights are about 10 feet away. Let me say all that again for those of you who are taking notes. If you shoot at f16 at 1 one sixtieth of a second, at ISO 200, I don't know if I said it the first time, ISO 2 to 400, with your zoom on your speed light set to 50 and your power set to half power from about 10 foot away, you will almost always have the correct exposure. That sounds a lot more complicated than it is, I promise, and we're going to show you some more examples coming through. But I've got two speed lights on this one and they're exactly the same settings. I've got one back here behind her, I've got one up here on the front that's hitting her bag and her. Now the flash duration is what froze all the motion because if you know anything about golf, she's swinging very hard. All the grass is moving, her club's in the air, um, but the flash duration is what freezes all that motion. So it's still at 1 one sixtieth of a second. Okay, so using those same settings, we're going to move over to something a little bit more extreme uh, in light painting. Still using the 16-16 rule, we're going to be sure that you move to the dark side. Obviously, when you're using long exposures, you have to move to the dark side, otherwise uh, the light will bleed in and things will get blurry. But as we go through these guys, you're going to see most of them are taken at night or really close to night. And using the same settings that we just did, but this one has three lights this time, one here, one here, and one up in the front. Still 16-16, so still at F16 at one... Uh, this one's not at 16 or 1 160th of a second, of course, because it's got to be a much slower shutter speed. Normally on these type of a light painting, for anywhere from 5 to 10 seconds. And that will let me have enough time to do what I want to do. So 5 to 10 seconds at F16. Still my ISO is 2 to 400. And the speed lights all settings are all exactly the same. The only thing that we change now is the shutter speed. Now the 16-16 rule at 1 1 60th of a second would have still worked just fine for the exposure on her. And she would have been exposed fine against a black background. And of course there wouldn't have been any light painting. It wouldn't have given it long enough for any of that light from the sky to come in. And it wouldn't have given me enough time to do the light painting. Uh, but one uh, five to 10 seconds lets me have that background light come in from the sky. It also lets me have all the, uh, the time to do my light painting. Now, when I'm doing my light painting, these are all just typically lights that I find at Lowe's, uh, Home Depot, Walmart, any kind of flashlight, um, sparklers you're going to see here in a second. So it's nothing, no fancy lights are bought, nothing extreme. This is just stuff that I find at the local hardware stores. Exact same settings here. Two lights in the back, one light in the front at 
f16 on my camera, 10 seconds on the shutter speed at 2 to 400 ISO, and this was taken almost dark. But since uh, the shutter is so long, it lets that sky come back in just enough to where it gives us some more drama. And yes, this is me shooting with my camera on a timer. So I typically set it to where it'll go off in 10 seconds. This is on first curtain sync. That'll probably be a question here in a second. First curtain sync, not rear curtain. That way I know exactly when the flashes are going to go off. So the flashes fire first. Then I dance around with this light. I'm sure that's a sight to see as well. Uh, some of these moms and other people at the weddings may be looking at me weird, but it turns out pretty awesome. Same exact settings here, but only two lights. One light directly behind them and one light off camera right. And this is dancing around with the sparklers at their wedding in the vineyard. I put this one in here too from the exact same wedding because so many times brides and grooms, they have this idea of what the sparklers are going to look like when they leave their wedding. And it never turns out that way. Seldom do I see a photo that is really the way it's supposed to be uh, or the way the bride and groom have envisioned it uh, when their photos are all said and done. But dragging your shutter just a little bit gives it a little more drama, it captures everything, but then when you know how to add your flashes in, your speed lights in, it will still freeze all that motion. So if you look at this photo, you can see this is the, the bride's son here, this is the second wedding, the bride's son smiling, everything's frozen here all these people here, expressions, you can see all their faces because I use the flashes to freeze all the motion, but because they're so light, I was able to drag my shutter and give it a little bit of the light painting and the trails there. So this one obviously wasn't as long as five to ten seconds, I think this one was about two seconds, maybe not even that long, uh, but it gave it just enough motion to where it really shows the energy of the event. So this one's a little bit different. Instead of moving the lights in the background or me dancing around um, with sparklers or a flashlight, this was still taken on the exact same settings, but instead of giving it uh, long enough for me to dance around in the background, all I did was take the photo and then twist it real hard. I guess it went uh, clockwise. So I took the photo and just went and twisted it real hard and that shrieked all the light that was in the background. So this was buildings back here with Christmas lights on them in the background. These are street lights back here. These are car lights um, back over here. Anything that has a light in it at that point is going to streak and twist and show motion where it may not have done that earlier. Uh, if, it, if I had taken it on a slower shutter speed and just exposed it correctly, all you would see then was car lights and Christmas lights in the background and it wouldn't have shown the same energy that this is. Now this isn't going to be something I do every time, obviously. This is kind of an extreme scenario of what an exposure light painting might do, but this also shows more about what's possible. But notice how she is still frozen. Her face is still sharp, her legs are still sharp, and all that's done because of how the flashes are set up. Again, settings, F16, this one's probably on two to three seconds. Um, ISO 2 to 400, speed lights are at 50 millimeters on the zoom at half power. Same settings here, same idea. Freeze them with the motion and then shake my camera a couple of times and it gives motion and meaning to, uh, or motion and energy to an otherwise kind of stagnant photo. There are so many times when you flash at a reception and yeah, it shows them exposed correctly but that's really all you get is the uh, bride and groom or the family or whoever, and it, especially in dark receptions. But if you do this, drag your shutter a little bit, it gives some energy to a photo that may have been lacking otherwise. Again, this isn't something I'm going to do 100 shots at a wedding like this, but it does give me something that is kind of unique and helps separate. Same thing here. I try to still the bride and groom for about 5 to 10 minutes at one point during the reception. And I say, hey, I've got this idea. Come out here with me. When they come out, I've already got my light set up. I say, hey, I need you to stand here. I need you to look here, do this. Take the shot. I've already tested it once on me, maybe an assistant, get all my exposures right. And I'm able to do these light paintings in just a couple of minutes, get them back to the reception. But it looks like a photo that we spent a lot of time working and creating. But I'm sure because of the bride and groom's time and how important that is, that um, we honor their time and the commitment they've got for the wedding and the guests that we don't want to pull them away for an extended amount of time. But having a shot like this is a really cool, meaningful shot, unique shot 
um, that's different than what they would have gotten otherwise from their wedding. Okay, I'm going to get asked about this one because this one is the exact same settings. Everything works exactly the same way except for the light painting is done with the concoction. You, you may know that steel wool burns, um, but it doesn't really burn until you start spinning it. And then when you spin it, it turns into this extreme sparkler. So what this is, is this is a wire whisk stuffed full of steel wool with a metal wire attached to it that was about um, three foot long or so. And when you light it at first, it doesn't do anything. But then when you start spinning it, it just starts throwing sparks everywhere. So this one took us a couple of times to get right, but the same, all those settings there that we've told you every time so far were just like this one. I think it's five to ten seconds, F16, etc. The trick is when she's spinning it, she had to slide it down the road to where she could then strike her pose because she's actually doing all the spinning and doing all this at the same time. And I'm taking the photo from the backside. So when she slid this out the first time, she threw it over the bridge and into the pasture with it throwing sparks everywhere, and that made everything a little bit more extreme than it, than it would have been. Otherwise, we had to jump out in the pasture and stop out a bunch of sparks, but that's what we do in Texas for fun, I guess. Uh, we're out on the edge of the country here, so it wasn't that big of a deal, but it sure uh, made us think a little bit about how we were going to do this going forward. Okay, so here's... Um, as promised, a little blurb about lightning photography. If you saw my post about it earlier, here's, here's my typical settings. At F8, ISO 400. One of the tricks is that you have to manual focus almost to infinity. Now, infinity on your lenses is at um, sideways 8, and it's important not to focus all the way to infinity, but just almost to infinity. Be sure to leave your camera on manual focus because you don't want it trying to focus on nothing, especially when you're doing lightning photos in the dark and your exposures are going to range anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds. Of course, you're going to be on a tripod, and a remote shutter uh, helps a lot uh, to where you don't get any shake, camera shake when you actually push your shutter. Now, safety first. This is a big tip that I have. I typically get up under underpasses as high as I could go and kind of squat up under the top of an underpass. Now, this is an incredibly safe place to be, but it also keeps me dry, keeps me out of the wind, um, and I don't have to worry about anything. I'm typically using a fairly wide angle lens, anywhere from 50 to wider, because um, I'm kind of guessing at where the lightning may or may not be coming from. But this is kind of the stuff that we get when we go do lightning photos. This is my favorite thing in the world to do, and we haven't had a really good storm come through our area in a while, um, but all three of these photos I'm going to show you now are all coming from the exact same storm. So like I said, ISO is normally around 400, around F8 and we're exposing anywhere from 10 uh, to 30 seconds. So that's my blurb on lightning photography. Okay, so enough about my images. You can, you can find ways to see them um, if you want to by either going to my website, uh, which is a photo biz one, another shameless plug for them, uh, or my Facebook page. But now I want to know uh, what you're hung up on. What do you need to have your light bulb moment? Once I understood TTL flash is when my photography has gone leaps and bounds over the last two years because of how I understand lighting. Um, once you get that kind of your light bulb moment, it's going to help separate you for everybody else and hopefully it's going to give you the juice and the energy you need to, to further your career. So now I want to do some, uh, some Q&A time. I want to open it up to everybody and see uh, what your thoughts are. Okay, what a great presentation. Thank you, Landon, for that. And we do have some questions, so we'll dive right into those. Uh, let's see. Sandy asks where you got the ring light and asks what brand. Okay, uh, the ring light is actually called My Ring Light. And when I got it several years ago, it was um, kind of a novelty thing. But I know now most of the camera stores you can get it. I know Dury's, Arlington Camera, uh, BH Photo, um, all those places you can get it from. I actually think the web address for it is myringlight.com, um, or it was several years ago, but that's been a while now. Awesome. Thank you for that. Let's see. Okay, John says, how do you take light readings when using TTL flash? So it's important that you change your uh, meter to spot metering from matrix or um, however you may have it set up. Put it on spot metering, and I typically uh, spot meter for the brightest part of the photo, especially if it's important that I keep on it. Um, 
So meter for the bright part and then just recompose everything. Set, set your settings to where your light meter is correct on the bright part, which when you move it to your subject is probably going to be considerably underexposed. But your light meter will then correct for all the settings, or the your TTL will correct for all the settings and make your exposure correct. Hope that made sense. Okay, thank you. He did he did have another question too, and he says, "Can you elaborate on controlling ambient light with shutter speed and flash output with aperture?" So, if you are able to, if you want to let your ambient light come in more, then I typically don't do it much with my aperture as much as I do with my shutter. So if I'm dragging my long shutters, that's going to let more light come in and increase my ambient light. If I'm shooting on TTL, then I'm typically shooting on fast uh, fast f-stops. But most of, I think what you're probably talking about is on like the light paintings or the more two, three light uh, manual settings. And if that's the case, then I control my ambient almost strictly by uh, how long my shutter is because I've got my exposures matched to my output on my speed light. Great, thank you. Okay, let's see. Samuel says, do you have your modifier on your speed light when you overpower the sun? It depends. Um, yes and no. I, I've done it both ways, but typically it's, it's going to be a bare bulb, harder light um, scenario than it might have been otherwise. Um, but, but be sure, a couple of things on overpowering the sun with your speed lights is you're going to want to be sure you zoom in as much as you can on your speed light. Now that's going to vary from light to light. It may stop at 85. You may be able to go all the way to 120. Zoom in as much as you can. Uh, shoot a full power, one over one, and then figure out your exposures from there. But it can be done overpowering the sun with the one speed light. Great. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Pat has a good question. He says, where do you get the large sparklers? <laughs> <laughs> that, those are, I typically bum whatever the weddings were, but uh, those that we used at that wedding, I, I kid you not, would have lasted 10 minutes or more. It was, it was crazy how long those suckers lasted. Okay. Uh, I normally stock up 4th of July or New Year's every year with smoke bombs and uh, sparklers to, to experiment through the year on. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let's see. Okay, Samuel has a question, and he says, when you're using first curtain sync on your long exposures, do you have the subject move right after the lights fire, or do they stay there throughout the exposure? Good question. They stay there throughout the exposure. Um, I tell them that they don't have to be super still, but to try to hold their spot the best they can. So I don't normally get them into poses that are impossible to hold for five to ten seconds. But most of the time, they stay there. I don't care if they blink or not, because the only light hitting them is from the uh, from the flashes. So they stay there the whole exposure. Okay, Good thank, question. Thank you. Okay, Speedy says, is the F16 giving you the star effect, or is that done in Photoshop? Nope, that that is doing doing in camera. So star effect will the the smaller the aperture you shoot at, so anywhere from 16 to 22 is going to give you more of a defined star in the background. The faster your, your f-stop is, so if you're down at 2.8 to 1.4, it's going to give you a lot more of a haze look from your speed lights, which is fun to play with at wedding receptions as well. I, I go back and forth changing my settings um, for, for those f-stops to get some of the star effects and then to get some of these kind of overall haze depending on what I'm looking for. But that is controlled from, from your f-stops. Great, thank you. Let's see. Jean says, I can't do TTL OC with my radio poppers. Any hope for me? I'd like to talk to you about which radio poppers you may be trying to use with what kind of combination of gear because everything you saw that I just did was all done with radio popper. Um, every bit of it, anywhere from the manual uh, setting stuff to the TTL stuff was all done radio popper. I guess be, be sure that it's, I think it's called the PX um, system, not. Um, not the cube system or not the uh, studio system. That's got to be the PX system. Okay, thank you. Okay, Peter says, do you ever bracket your exposures? Very, very, very seldom. Um, really only if I'm doing something HDR. Uh, for the most part, everything, well, everything you saw here was all done in one exposure. Okay, let's see. And Jake says, are you using on-camera flash to trigger the off-camera? And if so, how is the flash set? Yes. 
So I have a, a D600 as my main camera, and I use the pop-up flash to trigger my speed lights. Now you can do the same thing with the uh, commander on your hot shoe or with another speed light on your hot shoe, but it's just important that when you do it in your menu settings, either on your speed light or in your camera, that you turn it to where it has the dashes, to where it's set to commander mode with dashes on it instead of um, a power or a TTL. Then what's going to happen is it's going to look like it flashes, but all it's doing is giving the pre-flash for metering, um, and then it flashes whenever you take the exposure. But it's just real important that your, either your pop-up or your on-camera speed light is set to commander mode off, is what it's called. Okay, thank you. And Bonnie asks, um, do you use the in-camera light meter, not the handheld? Yes, I I may get some slack on this from some friends that may or may not be on this, but I, I don't even own a handheld meter. Everything I've done, everything I do is done with the in-camera light meter. Okay. And Amanda says, do you, uh, do you ever shoot by yourself or do you always take an assistant with you to hold your off-camera flash? So I shoot by myself almost completely. The only time I have somebody holding anything for me is if I am shooting a senior girl and typically mom or a friend is now my flasher. So the way I work around that and to kind of break the ice is um, ask them if they're an expert flasher and they look at me like, what are you trying to insinuate? And then I hand them the flash and it all works out well from there with the ice broken. Um, but the only time I have anybody hold the flash is if I'm shooting a, a senior girl. Everything else is either me holding it on that monopod or on uh, my Denny Easy Stands. Great, thank you. Okay, Speedy says, what are you using as a diffusing material on your 8-foot light? It is just a painter's drop cloth. And the backing on that system is the silver 4x8 insulation boards um, that you get at Lowe's. So literally everything on that light was purchased at Lowe's. Okay, and Celeste asks, what do you use for your radio slaves? Uh, radio popper, yep, completely radio popper. I've tried other things like Pixel King um, and some other things, but had to, just didn't have the consistency that I've had with radio popper, and uh, I've been using them since uh, since they came out, and it would take a lot for me to change. They're they're pretty great. Okay, and Michael has a question that I was kind of wondering too. <laughs> when you're dancing with the lights, do you get in the shot also? <laughs> So uh, the reason that you don't see me in the shot is one, I'm moving, and two, the, I keep the light in front of me. So I'm not twisting around and making the light hit me. So since nothing is actually hitting me, I don't register on the camera. So between the light not on me and um, me constantly moving, that's why I don't show up in any of those shots. Okay. Well, it looks like the last question that we had, did anybody have any more questions? I think we're good. Okay, well, did you have anything you wanted to add, Landon? No, I pr appreciate you guys taking part of your uh, Thanksgiving week to hang out with me. Um, I'm sure you heard a phone go off in the distance. I don't know if I said this at the first, but I actually crashed up here at uh, La Quinta uh, where my parents are staying in town to get on the Internet to hang out with you guys for a little while because all the Internet went down at the uh, uh, place where I'm staying. Uh, so I kind of was in panic mode all morning. But I think that everything uh, went pretty pretty smoothly. Um, but like I said, I really am an open book. I can't reiterate that enough. Um, in fact, let me go back to uh, that page and give you guys my contact info uh, one more time if you would like it. It's here. Um, use me as a resource. Uh, like I said, I'm teaching at a couple different conferences coming up in January. I'm going down to uh, Palm Beach, Florida for a light painting, a full day light painting workshop. Um, I'll be at SPI the following days in Orlando. We have Photo Pro Expo in Kentucky. Um, I'll be working at the uh, Graphic Authority booth in, uh, at Imaging USA. But the, none of those are sales pitches. I'm just a nerd that likes to talk and put names with faces. So uh, don't don't be a stranger. Be sure you say hi if you see me. 
Well, great. Thank you, everyone, for all your wonderful questions. And Landon, thank you so much for taking the time to present uh, to us today. A recording of today's webinar will be posted on our PhotoBiz YouTube channel at youtube.com slash PhotoBiz. Also, be sure to check out our blog and watch your email for updates about future webinars. Our next webinar will be all about content with our own SEO expert, Andy R., and that will be on December 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you again, Landon. And thank you again, everybody. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and have a great Absolutely. day, everyone.